O Lord, may the words that I speak and the thoughts that our hearts think be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A lawyer on his deathbed called his wife to his bedside. What do you want, dear? she asked. He asked her to bring to him her Bible. Since her husband had never been a very religious man, the woman was overjoyed to hear such a request. She ran and got her Bible and prepared to read some of her favorite verses to the dying man. Her husband, however, snatched the Bible from her hands and began quickly scanning one page after another. What are you doing, dear? He asked, his wife asks, asked. What do you think I'm doing? He replied. I'm looking for loopholes. This lawyer was certainly not the first person to look for loopholes, nor will he be the last. In today's Holy Gospel, we find a group of Pharisees trying to trap Jesus. The debate may have been about marriage and divorce, but it was really a question about loopholes. In our text, Jesus makes it very clear that when it comes to doing God's will, it's not about loopholes. It's about trusting in God's grace to forgive us when we fail and to help us to do what pleases Him, even when that is difficult. Verse 1 of Mark chapter 10 the verse right before today's gospel lesson tells us that Jesus and his disciples had left Capernaum and were now traveling in Perea on the eastern side of the Jordan River. This area was under the control of Herod Antipas, the same Herod whom John the Baptist had condemned for marrying Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. Perhaps this is why the Pharisees used the subject of marriage and divorce to try to trap Jesus. If Jesus responded to their question about whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife by saying no, he would not only alienate all those who thought that divorce was okay, he could also put himself in hot water with Herod, who had thrown John into prison and ended up eventually cutting off his head because John had condemned his marriage to Herodias. But if Jesus said that divorce was okay, then he would alienate the conservative faction within Judaism that did not approve of divorce except for infidelity. Jesus saw right through their trap, however, and he focused the debate away from human opinion and back to God's word. Always a good idea when you're having a theological debate. What did Moses command you, Jesus asked the Pharisees. Moses said it was okay, the Pharisees replied, citing the words of Moses in, Matthew, in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. But you're looking at the wrong Bible verse, Jesus told the Pharisees. The words of Deuteronomy 24 were given by Moses as an accommodation to human weakness human sinfulness. They do not, however, reflect God's perfect will. For that, you need to go back to Genesis 1, verse 27, which reminds us that it was God who first created male and female. And to Genesis 2, 24, where God says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Since, since, since it is God who has joined the man and the woman together, Jesus concludes, man has no business separating them. Mark doesn't tell us the reaction of the Pharisees to our Lord's response. The disciples, though, apparently asked for clarification. So Jesus spelled it out in no uncertain terms. Divorce is never in harmony with God's original plans for marriage. It is always the result of sin and is, in fact, sin itself, just like every other violation of God's will. But we don't like to hear things like that, do we? Whether we're dealing with divorce or any other violation of God's will. 
We always like to think that we have an excuse. We have a legitimate reason for doing what we do. That's where loopholes come in. The Pharisees were big on loopholes. Most legalists are. You make strict rules so that you can look good when you abide by them. And what happens when you can't or won't abide by them? That's where the loopholes come in. Loopholes give you a way out. Loopholes give you an excuse for not doing what you said you would do, what you know you should do. Loopholes are the best friend of the self-righteous person, the one who thinks he can impress God or his fellow man by what he does or doesn't do. God, look at how good I am. And oh, by the way, when I'm not, there is a reason for that. There's a loophole. I know I shouldn't gossip about my neighbor, but I heard her saying some pretty bad things about me. I know I wasn't totally honest in reporting all of my income on my tax return last year, but the government wastes too much of our money already. Why give them any more? I know that my friend needs my help right now, but I'm just too busy with other things. I already have too much on my plate. I know it was wrong to cheat on that math test, but everyone else was cheating too. If I didn't cheat, there's no way that I could have gotten a decent grade. And the list goes on and on, but I think you all get the point. We're all guilty of looking for loopholes when our lives don't measure up to what they should be. But it's not about loopholes. God doesn't want legalists, and He doesn't want libertines either, those who believe they can do whatever they want as long as they have a good excuse. What God calls for are people who trust Him enough to both admit when they have done wrong without making excuses and who also want God's help to do His will without looking for loopholes. In today's epistle, the author of the letter to the Hebrew Christians urges his readers, and that of course also includes you and me, not to turn our back on Jesus because of persecution or for any other reason. Jesus is greater than the angels, and yet for a little while he was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Because of Jesus, because of his death on the cross for our sin, there is no need for us to make excuses. We can freely admit our sins to God, knowing that for the sake of Jesus, there is complete forgiveness for all those who are sorry for their sins, for all those who trust in Jesus. And because of Jesus, because He will always lead us in the right path, the path that is best for us, there is no need for loopholes, no reason to look for excuses for not following God's will and every reason for asking God for the grace, for the ability to do what is pleasing in His sight, what is His good and gracious will. Marriage is, a closed, is the closest communion that can possibly exist between two people, and it's a closed communion. Not one, no one is allowed to drive a wedge between husband and wife. Marriage is also the only proper and healthy place for sexual love. Only in marriage can two people be naked and without shame with one another. Marriage is intended, though, to be a lifelong union. Only within a lifelong union can two people can be completely open with one another without fear of one or the other leaving. No other human relationship comes close to this one flesh relationship of husband and wife. It is completely unique. The only thing closer is the relationship between Christ and the church, between Christ and the believer, as St. Paul points out in Ephesians 5. This one flesh union of marriage is God's doing. It is His gift. God joins Himself. God Himself joins husband and wife together by His creative Word, and He calls them one flesh. And what God has joined together, let not man separate. The Pharisees were looking for loopholes. 
Jesus instead holds up the gift of God and his will for husband and wife. They are one flesh by God's word. And anyone who dares to get between them is answerable to God. Jesus' words should make us stop and think. They should make us think twice before getting married. Marriage is a holy estate and an institution of God. It is not ours to play around with as we please. These words of Jesus ought to make us very picky about the kind of person we marry. Do they, for example, share the same faith that we do? And these words of Jesus should also make us think very hard before divorcing our spouse. God hates divorce. Divorce is radical surgery with a blunt instrument. It is never pretty. It is never clean. It always leaves open wounds and scars. It's second only to death in terms of grief and loss. In fact, it really is a kind of death when sin has had its way with God's gift and one flesh has been torn in two. Some of you, I'm sure, have experienced that pain firsthand. Because divorce happens. We aren't Adam and Eve, and this isn't paradise, at least not anymore. Sin and death have had their way with marriage as with every other aspect of life. We live in a divorce-oriented world. World, Divorce has become an accepted part of life. Divorce does happen, and it happens to Christians. We need to be honest about this. Most of all, though, we need to confess our sins in this regard. We need to be forgiven. Whenever divorce happens, sin is always involved. If there were not sin between husband and wife, there would be no divorce. All that we can do is what a little child does when he breaks something of great value. There's no use trying to hide it or make excuses or blame someone else as we so often are tempted to do. The little child brings, the little child picks up the broken pieces and with runny nose and tears streaming down his cheeks, he sets the broken pieces at the feet of mom and dad and says, I broke it. I'm sorry. Are you troubled by these words of Jesus? Then bring to him in sincere confession your feelings, your fears, your thoughts, your sins. That's what believers do with the brokenness of their lives, and that includes broken marriages. They gather up the broken pieces and set them at the feet of their heavenly Father and humbly say, I'm sorry, I broke it. No excuses, no finger-pointing, no loopholes. Confess it before God. Bury it in Jesus' death. Receive Christ's forgiveness. And then live as one who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. God is gracious to his children. He rests his hands on our head and he says, I forgive you for the sake of my son who already paid the penalty for all of your sin. Jesus gave his life for all of us. The married, the divorced, the single, and the little children. He reached out in mercy to a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well who had been married five times and was now living with number six. He defended a woman caught in the act of adultery from her stone-throwing accusers, and then he absolved her. He became the adulterer in our place so that we might become his righteousness. If you are married, let Jesus always be at the middle, the center, the heart of your marriage. For he is the source of forgiveness between husband and wife. Only through Jesus can we truly forgive one another, which is so essential in a lasting marriage. Only through Jesus can husbands and wives receive each other as gifts from God. Only through Jesus can two become one flesh as God intends. So you see, our gospel lesson for day, today is really more about more than just marriage and divorce. It's about receiving all of the things of God in the way that God intends, without any excuses or loopholes, receiving them in the way of a little child. 
the only ones who really get things right in the 10th chapter of Mark are the little children. Not the Pharisees who tried to trap Jesus. Not the disciples who are upset because a lot of kids are disturbing their quiet time with Jesus. Jesus rebukes his own disciples just as he had the Pharisees. Let the children come to me, he says. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And Jesus took the little ones in his arms and he laid his hands on them and blessed them. Only the little ones get blessed by Jesus in our text. They don't come to him looking for legalistic loopholes. They don't try to trap him in his words. They don't quibble with the hardness of his teachings. And they don't come boasting about how good they are. They can't even come to Jesus on their own. They have to be brought like a little baby is brought to this font in holy baptism. And Jesus said, let, Jesus says, look at these little ones. That's the way of the kingdom of God. It's the way of the little child being given to Jesus. Like a little child, we receive everything as a gift from God. The washing of holy baptism, the forgiving words of absolution, the body and blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper, eternal life, salvation, and the grace of God to live according to His will. And in the same way, we who are married, or will be someday, receive from God the gift of our spouses, those with whom we are or will be one flesh, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy will. No loopholes, just God's gracious plan for his children, God's gracious will for your life and mine. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We rise to sing our canticle hymn number 956, Create in me a clean heart, O God.